You know, Vic and Yvonne are in Tanzania. I mentioned this morning at the prayer time, um, Yvonne's mother died on Friday. And um, so she's got a big decision to make whether she comes back to Australia or stays over there. Uh, be praying for her. There's a bit of a mix-up this morning, I'll tell you. Um, I sent an email saying what I was preaching for two weeks and some of that email didn't get to people. Um, I let three people know, but anyhow, um, so that's all right. Psalm 51, which was last week. We're up to Psalm 8 today, so let's come before the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you love us. We thank you, Father, for those who over the centuries have been preaching the truth of your word that has been impacting lives. Thank you that it's your Holy Spirit that works in people to draw people to yourself. And Father, I pray that what is written today has been for your glory and your glory alone. And I pray, Lord, that the words that are here will be taken by you and Lord ministering in the hearts of people to encourage them in their faith and I pray for your leading and guiding in all things now Amen That's what I want to do That's better You know when I look up at the stars at night, I don't know about you I can notice the very different patterns in them Panhandle, the Milky Way, the Southern Cross, to name a few. And we can also see some bright stars or some distant stars that are barely visible to the human eye. Yet as we look up and see the, the array of stars, we're looking at part of the universe system as a whole. And you know, exploration has taken it further and further and the system is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But as I think of the galaxies above us, I'm reminded of David's words in Psalm 8. Today, as we look at the psalm, we're going to look at it under three headings. God's greatness, man's honour, and man's responsibility. God's greatness. We live in a world where majority say to us, if God is real, let him prove it. Show him to us. Well, here in Psalm 8 is part of the answer to how God does speak to us today. Look at verse 3. If you've got your Bible open, follow it through. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. That is, the universe above. In fact, everywhere the way it is arranged in precise order. Have you ever considered what would happen if one of the planets went a quarter or a half degree off course? What would happen would be a cosmic mm, disaster explosion. But that will never happen because all is working perfectly according to God's design. He set them all in place so that they will stay there until the day God says no more. So as we look up and see God's creation, God is actually speaking to us through that creation. In Psalm 19 it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. If you stand out there at night and gaze up and look at the universe above, it shows you what you are. And you know what we are? We are but a speck, a speck 
from planet Earth compared to the vast array of the universe. But that array is speaking to you of God's greatness. It is pouring forth speech. It is not silent. It is saying to man, take a good look at yourself. Did this come by chance? And the answer, of course, no, it didn't. It was designed or created by someone. The Bible tells us that it was God that placed everything in place. Listen to Psalm 136 and verses 5 to 9, speaking about God. Who by his understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, the sun to govern by day and the moon and stars to govern the night. Psalm 147 tells us he determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. God knows each star by name. What does man know? Very little. Amos 5.8 says, He who made the plagues and Orion who turns darkness into dawn and darkness day and darkens day into night who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. You know, we're just finding stars out there now. You know, the name of the stars, what they're calling them, is what God's word says. It's interesting. Creation testifies to us of God's eternity and his power. It speaks to us and tells us that by his word all things were created in him, all things are sustained and held together. And when God decrees, they shall pass away. Nothing, and I say nothing happens without God's permission in this universe. If God created all things and understand he created us as well. The psalmist in Psalm 139 verse 13 says about God, For you knitted my innermost being, you knit me together, in my mother's womb. The point is God created us individually. We were no accident. We were created for a purpose and that purpose was to know God and to enjoy him forever. Have you ever had a good debate with someone over the evolution creation debate? I love them. As they talk, as they explain their thoughts or their philosophies, large big holes appear in them so that they can be easily exposed. They'll try to cover up their holes by creating other holes. Sadly, we have people who believe in theistic evolution. God controlled it all. I believe that all ideas of creation outside of God's creation as recorded in Genesis chapter 1 go against God's word. Let me encourage you to look up on a clear night. Think of the great stars and the great galaxy. Your God is saying, I created all this. It didn't happen by chance. Secondly, man's honour. You know, verse 4 raises a question that all people seek an answer to at some stage in their life. What is man? What is man in relation to the universe? What is man when you compare him to the cosmos? And the answer is given to us in verses 5 to 8. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. And notice two things. In verse 5, we are told that God has crowned man with glory and honour. God has not crowned the animal kingdom, but only mankind. God created mankind in a very special way. He created him after his own image. God gave man a soul, a spirit, 
that will never die. Yet God made him also pinnacle of his creation. Man was to live in relationship with God and his cr creation. But sin entered the world and man fell and was cast out of the garden. And since that time, man continued to sin and go further and further away from God. So God responded by coming to man's aid. Jesus came to be the perfect man, one who would fulfill all of God's decrees. He came as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. He would die on the cross. And through his death and resurrection and ascension, mankind can now be restored back into relationship with God. For all who take Jesus into their life as their Lord and Saviour, they are restored back into relationship with God and with others as well. You see, sin marred our relationship and we needed a saviour. We could not come back to God by ourselves. Christ had to come to restore us back and the Spirit had to work in our hearts to draw us to God. Secondly, in verse 6, God made man ruler over all. Everything was and is subjected to him. God created man to be his representative here on earth. He was God's vice regal, if you like, to look after and maintain everything. All the animals were subject to him. Animals would submit to him. You could walk with the lion. You could play with the cobra. The alligator would be your pet as you swam up the river. And so on. But then sin came. And those relationships were broken. All the animals are not subject to man. For some, they think a spider, a mouse, a snake, a lion will create a fear in them. It is part of our former makeup, and it shall be that way until Christ returns and establishes new heaven and new earth. Let me ask you what do you fear in the animal kingdom? How do you fare with your dominion over them. How would you feel in a den of lions or in a ring, of, a ring of cobra snakes? How would you feel swimming with crocodiles or white-pointed sharks? Gulp. Yeah, it was great when I had all my dogs. When I had my dogs, my dogs would obey me. But I am fearful of some snakes, some snakes I'm not. I've grown up that way. I have not been around tigers, so I wouldn't know them, and yet I see a picture in the paper the other day of the guy at Mogo who read the cub, sitting there playing with the cub, the tiger. Alligators, I don't want to know about, <laughs> and so on. You know, we all actually live in fear of creatures. A lady can chase and kill a mouse, but they can be fearful of a spider. And sadly, sin has marred our personal relationships as well. Husbands and wives don't always live in perfect harmony. I like to ask, who's lived in perfect harmony all their lives with their partner, their husbands? Can you notice there's no hands go up? My wife would be standing up and say, that is true, we don't. Um, anyhow, um, yeah. My wife likes to tell me how wrong I'm all the time. She loves it, actually. Um, but children don't always obey their parents either, do they? Today's Father Day, Father's Day. And you know, there will be some fathers who won't get a call from one of their children. Whose fault is it, the child's or the father's? S some of the ways the fathers bring their children up is not right. But some of the children end up the wrong way. You know, sin hasn't just marred all these relationships. 
It's also marred our spiritual relationship as well, our spiritual vision. That's why in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 it says, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. I am thankful that we have God's word because God tells us he loves us and that we are special in his sight. Out of this great universe, the speck on the earth is special in God's sight. Third point, man's response. When man considers how great he is, when he considers that he is the recipient of all of God's condescending love, then man should respond in the correct way, and that is to give praise and worship to God. Look at verse 1 and verse 9. They say, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Man's praise should be a personal one of his relationship with God. Man needs to acknowledge God as his personal God because that is the only way praise will reach God. But it is sad that man has turned his back on God and created his own God to worship him. Man ex ex has exchanged the glory of God were a created idol of some form. It may be of the stars, the sport, other people, possessions, animals, families, money and so on. Many turn away from God's grace to grasp foolish philosophies that appear to their itching ears. They don't want to know Jesus as they substitute him for other things. They praise and worship the created and not the true God. And by doing this, they are hurting God's heart. We all have, have sad hearts at times. I'd ask you to, to consider how sad God's heart must be. As he created and gives us all that we have, he has provided a way for man to come back into relationship with him and majority of mankind treat him as dirt. All of mankind, and I've got to say, even us at some stage in our life have been like that. No wonder Romans 5.10 tells us that we were all God's enemies. Yet God demonstrated his love for us in giving Christ to be our saviour. Christ came to reconcile man back to God and we and when we take Christ into our hearts as our Lord and Saviour there is great joy in heaven when the lost sheep return to him and it's only then our praises will rise as a pleasant aroma into God's presence. I don't know about you but I know when I got go past certain shops, there can be a pleasant aroma oh. coming out of them. Nice cooking smells draws people to, to them, don't they? But the same goes for our lives, doesn't it? If we love Jesus and we follow God's way and give thanks and praise to him, then a pleasant aroma you go it goes out of us to God but as that goes to God there's also the point that it flows his love will then flow out through us through our lives to other people and that should attract people towards God through us our praise of worship to God should not be Sunday morning at church it should not be here I'm sorry, it should not be here. Our praise and worship to God should be 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's when we should be living to praise God. No matter where we are or what we are doing, we are to shine for Jesus. So I want to encourage and challenge you that as you look up at the stars, Think of Psalm 8. Consider who you are and what you are 
in this creation. Then consider how much God loves you and respond to him in the right way. Our response has to come out of our hearts and our mouths. If the stars can tell the, the glory of God as they appear in the sky, then what about us? If we have God's revealed wor word that tells us of the love of God in Jesus, shouldn't we be witnesses of God's love and grace to others as well? The psalm began and ended with the words of praise to God. May our lives begin and end with thanks and praise to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. You first loved us. And we thank you that Christ came to save us. We thank you, Father, the Holy Spirit testified in our heart that we needed a saviour because we could not come by ourselves. You had to draw us. But we thank you, Father, that as your family, your spirit is the one who's going to minister to us. Your spirit is the one who's going to build us up. Father, help us to love you 24-7. Help us, Lord, to be encouraging each other. Help us, Lord, to be out there shining for you. For the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen.